Good morning, this is Father Joseph Hagen. I'm here with Father Hyacinth Grubb. We are beginning an, another series, as you can tell, I love lists. And this series will be um, a, um, a series of meditations on the different mysteries of the rosary. Essentially just discussing as brothers what we think about when we pray these different mysteries. And so it's my honor to be here with Father Hyacinth, and together we'll be talking about the different joyful mysteries. So we start with the first joyful mystery, and that's the Annunciation. So Father Hyacinth, I'm, I'm going to hand the ball over to you. Just tell me, what are your thoughts when you're praying the first joyful mystery? What are the ways you meditate upon it? Well, uh, personally, something I've been meditating on recently is there's a way in which Mary was prepared for the Annunciation and a way in which she wasn't, oh, right? There's yeah. that. It's sort of the, uh, um, the unexpected surprise is very evident uh, yes. in the Gospel text and in, in just what it is, yeah. you know, God coming to be a man in this, this young woman's womb. It wasn't on her calendar. Was not on a calendar at all. No. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and we can see that in her, her response, the, the surprise of, mm -hmm. of what an unexpected uh, message this was and at the same time the ways in which she was prepared for this from her own conception she was immaculately conceived yes, yes, yes. free of sin and, and the defects of sin and um, made ready in this way and so we can see that too in so many images of the Annunciation uh, you can see Mary holding a book and she's not reading there that's a prayer book right mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. and there's this tradition that Mary was praying um, or even praying the Psalms well when Gabriel appeared to her and so she had <clears throat> prepared herself for this message without knowing it in a way. Yeah. No, oh, I love that. Uh, one thing I will think about too is I'll think about how Mary says yes. Um, Thomas Aquinas teaches how she says yes on behalf of all of us. And on behalf of all of us who don't always say yes to God. Um, you know, so I think of her kind of as like a concert mistress, like the first chair of the violin. And right before the concert begins, there's a the clamor of the orchestra, and then the concert mistress comes out and gives that perfect A, that tuning note, and then the whole orchestra tunes off of that. In the same way, um, when I pray the first mystery, I kind of think I need tuned up because uh, I kind of want to say yes to God, but the parts of me that don't want to say yes, or you know, I have my conditions, uh, I'm a little bit out of tune, you know, every day, just the way instruments go out of tune. Not because they're ter terrible instruments, just that's what happens with instruments in this world. In the same way, my heart will go out of tune. Uh, and so uh, praying that first mystery, asking Mary to sort of tune up my heart to, to say yes with her. And even if I sort of feel completely out of tune, to at least know she said yes. <laughs> <laughs> at least know she said yes and Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Um, yeah, so those are just some quick thoughts on the first mystery any i don't want to wrap up too quick any other remaining thoughts yeah right? just something that's been implicit so far but to yeah. make it explicit the annunciation is about god's work um, yes. happening yes. in us yes, yes and yes. so this yes that we give the, the ways in which we prepare ourselves for it even or the ways in which it's unexpected these are all responses mm -hmm. to the gift of god which um sort of breaks into the world yeah. uh, in, in order to heal the world in, in marvelous uh, and, and just truly an unsurpassable way. And sometimes, as in the Annunciation, God's breaking into the world is literally one cell big, right? He is one cell that's incarnate, and then it doubles and doubles and doubles and doubles. Uh, so even in small, hidden ways, God does great things in our lives. And so today, we thank you for joining us. We pray that the grace of the Annunciation will guide us today the grace of God doing great things, even if small and hidden, and that Mary, our mother, will guide us today for whatever is unexpected, but knowing that God has prepared, it, prepared us for it from the beginning of time. God bless you, and we'll talk with you soon. Thank you. Good morning. Once again, this is Father Joseph Hagen coming to you from the Prior at St. Vincent Fair. Again, it's my honor to be here with Father Hyacinth Grubb, and we're continuing our meditations on the rosary, on the joyful mysteries. So, Father Hyacinth, today we're going to talk about the second joyful mystery, the visitation. Uh, so when you pray this mystery, just tell me some of your thoughts. Yeah. So if the, uh, if the Annunciation is about God 
sort of breaking into history to save us, the visitation is almost Mary's first response to that, mm-hmm. right? Which is to go to go forward and to share that joy uh, with others and, and with her, well, you know, specifically with her, her cousin Elizabeth, yeah. who has also received a message of joy. And so there's this sort of call and response action we see between the Annunciation and the Visitation. And I love how what Mary brings to Elizabeth is nothing less than Jesus Christ himself. Oftentimes, I'll, I'll either pray sort of in the, on Mary's side, like, Lord, help me to bring Jesus Christ to all who I meet today, both my brothers, those who I minister to, but I also sometimes will think of myself in the place of John the Baptist in the womb, leaping for joy, asking God for the grace that uh, when he comes to me and my brothers and then the people in the parish, uh, the people in New York, that I would have that grace to leap for joy. Hopefully, like just internally, it'd be a little bit weird if you literally leap for joy at every time Christ comes to us. But to have that, just the way John just didn't hold back to have that readiness to uh, perceive Christ's presence, even if hidden, and to rejoice in it. Or in the place of Elizabeth, to uh, to wait and to hear Mary's song of joy, right? The, the visitation is when we hear the Magnificat, that, mm-hmm. that great canticle of joy. My, my spirit magnifies the Lord. Yeah. Uh, my spirit rejoices in, um, in God. And this, this uh, you know, Mary coming to Elizabeth, but also coming to each of us, bringing Christ, her son, to fill us with grace through Christ and to sing her, her song of joy in our hearts, too. I, for me, I just en- envision the, the monstrance with the host in it, that Mary singing her Magnificat, right, the, the great beauty, the, her magnifying the Lord, um, it's like the monstrance which takes the host, such a, a humble thing, yet still the Lord Almighty, and elevates him and then radiates beauty around him. I think there's something about that call to magnify the Lord given to each of us to hold Christ in transparent hearts, the way the monstrance holds the host, and then to magnify his beauty, to magnify his truth in this world. Um, and to do so because we are sons and daughters of Mary. And just as she tuned us up at the Annunciation, now we get to sing with her at the Visitation. Good. Yeah. Well, thank you again for joining us. Hopefully, we, we're doing this hopefully so we can pray the Rosary together with a little bit more uh, fervor, just to know the riches of Mary's heart, which means to know Christ himself, uh, to rejoice in him and to magnify him. So may that grace be yours to carry Christ in your heart today and to magnify him to all whom you meet. And we hope to talk with you tomorrow. God bless you. Good morning. Once again, this is Father Joseph Hagen. I'm here with Father Hyacinth Grubb, and we're speaking with you from the Priory of St. Vincent Fair. And we're continuing our series of the different mysteries of the Rosary, continuing with the joyful mysteries. Today, it's, well perhaps the best mystery, at least in my books, the the birth of Jesus Christ, right? So the third joyful mystery, the nativity. I even have a mug here. We're having a little Irish breakfast tea. and uh, It's the veneration of Jesus by the three magi, still in the manger. So, Father Hyacinth, I mean, there's no wrong answer. What do you think about when you're thinking about (laughs) the nativity, the birth of Jesus Christ? Mm, There's so much right there. (laughs) I mean, it's... uh... The more the closer, the more you know about Christ, the more you know Christ. The, yes, yeah. the more marvelous the, the nativity um, becomes. It's it's the moment where we where we see the face of God. You know, mm-hmm. think of this whole scriptural mm-hmm. tradition of, of wanting and waiting and desiring to see the face of God. Psalm twenty seven, you know, Lord, your face I seek. Yeah, even um, Moses going up to yeah. Mount Sinai, wait, wanting to see the face of God, yet not able to yet. And then Elijah hides his face in well, like First Kings nineteen. Yeah. yeah. Again, wanting to see the face of God, but not able to. But it's not until Christ comes and is born can we really see the face of God. And in a way, that's yeah. really that's more what this mystery is about than than about Jesus becoming man, because that's the Annunciation, yep, yep, right? Yeah. The incarnation. He happened. reveals His face to us. Yeah. I love that. I, I also think about um, the poverty of it all, being born and stable. This is something our Franciscan brothers do so well. Uh, and I think about how. 
right? He wasn't born on Park Avenue. He wasn't born at like a five-star hotel. Uh, and that, well, that gives my heart courage and confidence that if he can be born in manger, then uh, he can be born in my heart too, that uh, he will not disdain my heart as poor as it is. And to, uh, you know, to ask, to hope, to pray that my heart will be the heart where when Mary and Joseph knock on my heart, they can bring the Christ child in. And I assume that when they got into that manger, uh, I'm guessing Mary was kind of tired, but Joseph perhaps like, you know, swept up some of the hay and sort of put things a little bit into order. Uh, and I sort of asked Mary and Joseph to do the same thing. You know, like uh, my heart is gonna, it's gonna be a work in progress until death, until heaven. Uh, but at least sweep some of the loose hay up, you know, <laughs> and just get it ready, uh, uh, get it ready as much as, you know, you can uh, to, to, to be a place for Jesus and to know that, like, in a way, Jesus delights in the manger. And I pray he delights in my own poverty of heart. And I, and I have to say it when talking about poverty and the birth of Jesus Christ, it's not in scripture by any means, but the little drummer boy right what <laughs> gift do i have to give my king and he's he gives a drum solo which is a very strange gift to give a baby most people don't want drum solos around their kids um, but just that idea of like which is true that we give the lord whatever we have and he delights in it just to bring that gift whether it's a drum solo whether it's gold frankincense and myrrh whether it's just our time to bring those gifts in honor of Christ who became a gift for us. And one final thought um, is that when, when Christ came, he came for every man and every woman. Mm -hmm. And you can see this in, in the, the story that I tell you yourself. Think about all the different people who came through that, that stable. Yes. You know, rich and poor, men and women, you know, everyone was there. Both the, the, the Jewish shepherds and the Gentile magi. Yeah. yeah. And I, you, that's reflected in a wonderful way in art. When you look at depictions of, of Mary and her child yeah. throughout the world, you see them depicted in, in whatever race and ethnicity of, of the people that she appeared to. Yes. And so when she appeared in Mexico in Our Lady of Guadalupe, she mm -hmm. was Mexican, right? Mm -hmm. And when she well, mestizo specifically. Mestizo she specifically, Both yeah. sort yeah. of um, native Mexican but also Spaniard. Yeah, it was a mix. Yeah. yeah, and when she appeared in Vietnam, she was Vietnamese, and mm -hmm. when she appears in China, she's China, and when she appears in France, she's French, and that's that's yeah. a, a sign that that Mary gives us, and that Jesus gives us too, in all these different depictions of him, and and all these different ethnicities and races that he came for each and every one of us. Yeah, Amen. Uh, and the, and yeah. that he truly wants to be our brother. Yeah. Mary truly is our mother, uh, and so while certainly historically she's Palestinian. Um, she's our mother, so like she comes looking like us, yeah. In whatever way that is, and there's yeah. a, a great hope and a great confidence in that too. And the the real hope is that we will look like him at the end of the days. So that we will mm. look, see his face mm. in heaven, and be transformed into what we see. And so we ask that the grace of Christmas, even in these hot days, will be yours today, to know the face of Christ, to know his poverty, to know his love for you and that he will bring all of us to his heavenly homeland. And we hope to speak with you tomorrow. God bless you. Good morning. This is Father Joseph Hagen. I'm again joined with Father Hyacinth Grubb, and we're continuing our series on the mysteries of the rosary, uh, the joyful mysteries. Today we're doing the fourth joyful mystery. That is the presentation of Jesus in the temple. This I don't, I don't know. I'll say this. I think the first three joyful mysteries, most of us have some thoughts. They're kind of, you know, we get them. The presentation, and perhaps the next one too, the finding, they're a little bit more, well, I would say mysterious, but they're all mysteries. Uh, so this might be a little bit, we might have to learn a little bit from each other. Um, do you want to go first? I can go first, whatever you like. <laughs> well, first of all, in the presentation, this often gets confused. It's not the circumcision. No. Circumcision yeah. is eight days. Yeah. Presentation is 40 days afterwards. And the presentation is really about Mary in a way. It's mm -hmm. about Mary. You know, it's, it's, well, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's part of the, uh, the old law, the Levitical law, um, that a mother, 40 days after childbirth, would go and would offer a sacrifice mm -hmm. in, in Thanksgiving for, yeah. um, for this child. Uh, and as a, a sort of purification of, of all the um, 
sort of labors of, of, of childbirth. Yes, yes. And so Mary when and, and in the law, there's a provision for those who are wealthy and those who are poor. Yes. Right? A, a lamb or two turtle doves. Yeah. Right? And so it's, it's uh, Mary offers two turtle doves a, as a way of thanking God for the gift of her son, which is what, you know, the, the Levit Levitical yeah. law required and is a way of fulfillment of that law in the life of Jesus. And of course... In reality, she's offering the true Lamb of God, yeah. right? Um, and so in a way, um, well, St. John Paul II had a beautiful phrase. He talks about the presentation <clears throat> as the second annunciation because that is when Mary hears the prophecy of Simeon, a prophecy that Jesus Christ will be for the rising and falling of many in Israel, and he will be a sign that is contradicted against, a sign of contradiction, and that Mary's own heart will be pierced. And to think about that, 40 days old, right? All of the great hopes any mother would have, but especially if you know your son is the eternal son of the Father, to hear that your son will, will suffer, will be contradicted, and that you will suffer with him. Uh, for me, I think about Mary's, how... This is not a scripture, but I, I sort of sense it, that she says to her son, wherever you go, I will go. Whatever you suffer, I will suffer. Whoever you forgive, I will forgive. Whatever you do, I will do it with you. Right? She doesn't know all the details about how Jesus, her son, will suffer. She doesn't know all the details about Good Friday. But, I mean, she knows enough of the prophet Isaiah that the, 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 the Messiah will suffer. Uh, now hearing this prophecy, this sort of just like, I am completely yours, Jesus. And wherever you go, I'm going. Uh, that sort of, she says yes to being a mother at the Annunciation. And now she says yes to being Our Lady of Sorrows at the presentation. And it's also it's still a joyful mystery because it's, uh, she is, her heart is, she says out of love, which at the end of the day is a joyful thing. Uh, so I often ask Mary to help me to say yes to Jesus, just a full blank check. Wherever you're going, Jesus, I'm going to, uh, even if I kind of want to stay back and be safe. <laughs> like to have that encouragement of Mary to, um, okay, Jesus, if this is the way we're going to go, if it's going to go to Calvary, uh, well, take me with you because I'd rather be with you there than be apart from you elsewhere. Yeah. And in a way, it's a second annunciation too in that it, uh, it's a sort of ordinary moment, right? Yeah. In a, it is a, certainly a, a special moment, I would imagine, for any mother. Yeah. But, but, it, but it's sort of the ordinary course of, of um, having a child and, and raising them. And into that, uh, this prophecy of Simeon and the presence of Anna, the prophetess Anna, yes, yeah. comes. And, uh, and again, it's this invitation to open our hearts and expect that God will speak to us through unexpected people and in unexpected ways in the sort of normal parts of life that are no longer normal because yes. we have Christ within us. Good, good. Well, I think that's good for now. We can always do more later. Yeah, we can so. come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us this morning. We hope that these are helping you meditate with Mary and pray with her that our hearts may belong completely to Christ. And then that will be our joy. We wish you that joy today and every day. Thank you for joining us today and we hope to speak with you tomorrow. God bless you. Good morning. This is Father Joseph Hagen. I'm joined once again with uh, Father Hyacinth Grubb. We're continuing our series on the mysteries of the rosary, the joyful mysteries in particular. And today we're discussing the fifth joyful mystery, the finding of the child Jesus on the third day by his parents. So Father Hyacinth, what do you think about when you pray this mystery? Yeah, so this this mystery, um, just just a refresher, is is when Jesus was about twelve. Mm -hmm. um, his family was in Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, and with a bunch of extended family and a whole sort of gathering from their village, um, and the whole clan kind of packs up and goes home. And three days later, Mary looks around and says, "Where's Jesus? I thought he was with his cousins, mm -hmm. right?" And he's he's back in the temple, um, and so it takes three days from the, before before she finds him. And I think uh, it's especially apparent in, in this fifth mystery and in the fourth one, the, the presentation, how 
Father Joseph mentioned this um, in an earlier episode of this, that the joyful mysteries are, are sort of tinged with sorrow mm-hmm. in a way. There's, mm-hmm. um, which is true of all of the joyful mysteries. Right? And you think about the sort of uh, touch of sorrow that Mary must yeah. have had when, yep. when yep. giving birth in a stable. And you go through all of them yeah. like that. Um, and in Christ, we can see that um, joy and sorrow are, are sort of mingled in this, this sort of yes. melancholic way because we are still within this veil of tears. Yes, you know, yes, we, yes. That's, that's what life is here. It's like a good Irish song. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Good Irish song. Well, it's from the Salve Regime. It's old in Ireland. That's true. But, <laughs> I, I'll admit the point. I'll concede. <laughs> but but in this veil of tears, with the, the, the presence of Christ brings joy. That is, yeah. that doesn't make that sorrow go away, but is deeper than that sorrow. Amen. Yeah. yeah. I, I think about how when Mary and Joseph find their son and and she says, we've been looking for you anxiously. And I pray, I ask Mary, that that would be my one anxiety, to seek Jesus. If you have to be anxious about something, that's the thing to be anxious about. Where is Jesus and how can I be with him? Uh, and to ask Mary's help that I would let go of the other anxieties about my to-do list, my email inbox, fulfilling the different demands I put on myself that God hasn't put on me and and having that one desire uh, of where is Jesus and that kind of goes back to what we're saying about the the nativity of seeking his face um, and having that be the first thing and that also pairs nicely with Jesus's response of you know why I wasn't hiding I was in my father's house and so often, that's what he says to me when I say, like, Jesus, I've been looking for you. And he says, um, Father Joseph, like, I'm here in the church right next to you. I'm not hiding. I'm in a big gold box called a tabernacle, right? And just to know that great grace of spending time in the Father's house with the eternal Son, which, to translate that, to spend time in the church, in the chapel, with the Eucharist. Uh, and in a way, he's not hiding. He's like right there. There's even a light to let us know he's there. Um, and, you know, so often I'll, I'll, I'll be looking for him and he's saying, I'm in my father's house. <laughs> Just come and find me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, it's, 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 I, I, I think of that every time. Where is God? Oh, he's right. He's in the church, of course. Right? That, that's obvious, and yet we have to be told it over and over again, that God is in the church and in the sacraments, and that's where we find them. And certainly, in a particular way, he's everywhere, right? God's omnipresent. So wherever you are, when you make an act of love, he's there with you, right? Wherever there is love, where two or three are gathered in his name, he is there. But there is just something powerful to being in the Eucharistic presence. And I think that's something we learned the hard way with the recent COVID shutdown. Luckily, we've been able to keep the churches open the whole time, uh, but restricted hours and all the face masks and everything. And uh, I think we felt that hunger of like, okay, I know he's present with me in my apartment, in my home, but I can't wait to get back to church. So um, obviously use your caution, but always know the churches are open for you, that Christ uh, is longing for you and In a sense, he's hiding, but not really. He's right there in the tabernacle. Uh, And may that be our one anxiety today, uh, the sweetest anxiety of seeking him, that he would fulfill that deep desire and take away from us all the needless anxieties of this world. And so we hope that these meditations and the joyful mysteries have been uh, a help to you as you pray, as you meditate with our mother, Uh, and ultimately so that we may know Christ more and seek him with all of our hearts. Thank you as always for joining us. We hope to speak with you tomorrow. Have a good day and God bless you. Good morning, this is Father Joseph Hagen speaking with you from the Priory of St. Vincent Fair. I'm joined this morning with Brother Frisai Davis. We're here to continue our meditations on the mysteries of the rosary and Together with Brother Versailles, we're going to enter into the Luminous Mysteries. Today we'll cover the first Luminous Mystery, the Baptism of Jesus Christ in the River Jordan. Oh, yeah. So, Brother Versailles, just share with us, what what do you think about, what do you pray about with this mystery? Well, I like the Luminous Mysteries because, uh, specifically the Luminous Mysteries, 
it's kind of a, a new school mm. uh, acquisition that the church has given us in, in recent times. They're that, fresh. Yeah, they're these fresh mysteries that we have. And, uh, you know, some people might not be used to, even today, praying with the Luminous Mysteries. But just to kick off the first Luminous Mystery Please. with the way that Jesus kicked off his Luminous Ministry with the baptism. He's baptized by his cousin. And, uh, and it's at this moment that we have a representation of the Trinity. Yes. All three of yes. the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, give us this representation of Jesus being baptized in the River Jordan. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, God the Father speaking down from the heavens, and you see the, the Holy Spirit represented as a dove. And uh, there's this beautiful image of the three mm -hmm. persons of the Trinity present at that moment of baptism and how everybody who is baptized a Christian has that indwelling of the Trinity within us, which is to say that God is in us so that we can bring Christ to others. Um, and it's a, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful mystery to, to meditate on in that Jesus was baptized and he calls us to that same baptism. And I love two of those words of the Father. This is my beloved Son. Just how um, each of us in our own grace of baptism, this is the word the Father speaks to us, both on the day of our baptism, but just as a continuous word uh, pouring over us. This is my beloved daughter with whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And it's because the Trinity dwells within us by grace that the Father can look upon us with that same love. Uh, and so many of us will spend can spend a lot of uh, uh, energy trying to get that deep affirmation, that deep love. And oh, it's God. freely given by the Father, uh, just by the grace from baptism and, and that deep affirmation he offers us. Right. And uh, yeah, just those words of the Father, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Um, we're all striving to, to reach that, that sort of favor with God. Um, and it's similar, you know, if you, uh, if you just take the relationship between a father and a son, uh, really kind of looking for that approval in various ways, whether you're a woodworker or whether you're trying to do well in baseball or cross country yep, or whatever, yep, yep. Uh, there's something really uh, satisfying when your father says, you know, I'm very pleased, I'm very happy with you. Um, and yet, you know, without any sort of, uh, without any sort of, uh, questioning, Jesus receives that sort of affirmation, and there's a there's that representation of the oneness of the yeah. Trinity. One twist that kind of goes outside of the mystery, but it's important, Give it is to me. that immediately after his baptism, Jesus, by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, drives him into the desert to be tempted. And sometimes when we're in the midst of temptation or we feel our weakness, we feel that God's abandoned us, that we're no longer his beloved. Mm -hmm. uh, and the mystery of the baptism is, is, speaks truth to that confusion, the truth that Jesus Christ himself, the beloved son, goes into the desert to, to show the depth of what it means to be a beloved. And so to have, this is a great mystery to pray, I mean, every Thursday, certainly, or every day if you can. Mm -hmm. But even in the midst of temptation, to uh, when we feel like we we don't we, we we're no longer beloved, to pray this mystery to know that uh, even when we feel driven into the desert, or we brought ourselves into the desert, maybe right. that the Father still looks upon us, and even if it's you know the prodigal son, if I'm playing the role of the prodigal son. The Father still looks upon me as his beloved and just is calling me home. Amen. So we hope that this these meditations will help you, help help each other as we pray the rosary. And we pray that today we have the grace of knowing the Father's love for us. Um, thank you for joining us today. We hope to talk to you tomorrow. God bless you. Bye. Good morning. This is Father Joseph Hagen. I'm here again with Brother Frasati Davis to continue our series on the Luminous Mysteries. Today, we will meditate together on the second Luminous Mystery, the miracle at the wedding feast at Cana. This is a great one, but Brother Frasalia, you get dibs. What, right. what do you want to share about first? Yeah, I mean, every time we pray the second Luminous Mystery, I just think about how, how amazing it was that the first miracle that Jesus performed 
was at a wedding party. Yes. Uh, you know, we have all these accounts of him healing the sick. Yeah. We have yeah. him yeah. Yeah. Uh, curing the ill, even raising the dead. But his first miracle that he shows to others, his, his glory, the glory that he receives from the Father, is changing water into wine. And there's something that really, uh, really helps in, in meditating that, uh, you know, there's something beautiful about that, that sort of exchange. And it's a very practical thing. Yeah. But from that practicality, he's able to show the glory in which he's given and the glory that he, he calls us to. One of the, the key parts of the wedding feast at Cana, it comes at the very, very end, and that's when uh, St. John's Gospel tells us that this is when his disciples began to believe in him. Mm -hmm. And so certainly it's a great thing to get really good wine, but oh, yeah. the, the, the deep, the, the deep uh, gift here is the gift of faith, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, you can't just buy on Amazon.com, right? It's... <laughs> And sometimes you almost wish you could buy it for people. You can't. Yeah. Uh, and it's a gift given. And particularly there's Mary's intercession. Oh, yeah. And the you, way... you went right there. I yeah. was just thinking. And so, so many times asking Mary, like, uh, for parts of my heart that are still, you know, maybe doubting, not fully believing, you know, Lord, I do believe, help my unbelief. Or for people in my family and my friends, asking that Mary would intercede with Jesus to pour that new wine of faith into their hearts. Right, and so, like you said, the disciples, it's at that moment where they have this sign that they begin to believe in, in Jesus and, and who he is, but it's really looking to Mary. She already knows who her son is, mm. and it's her short conversation with the, yeah. with the head waiter, you know, uh, do whatever he tells you yes. is what he, she tells him. Um, because she knows that he's capable of, of doing great things. Um, and it's, it's looking at Mary's example, her relationship with her son, that the disciples are, are brought to a greater relationship yes. and greater trust in the Savior. And that's what we are called to. And there's also a, a deep poverty of spirit on Mary's part. And what I mean by that is by asking her son to work his first public miracle, she understands that she that he'll begin his public ministry yep. and that means he's not coming home for dinner anymore <laughs> which is that's a big sacrifice yeah yeah to let your son go and she knows maybe not all the details but she knows that he will be a sign of contradiction yeah and to to sort of forfeit her right to have him come home for dinner each night to ask her you know how was your day mary I mean, that's kind of nice if jesus is always there to ask you how your day's been. Uh, but also knowing that your son will, not only your son, but your son and your Lord will be rejected yep. uh, and will end up being crucified. And so the sort of surrender, not the sort of surrender, but the deep surrender she makes in initiating, she's almost giving him permission to, to leave home and to begin this next chapter. Uh, and saving the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, this is much greater than just a kid going off to college who's going to be able to come home for holidays. It's like, at this moment, Jesus is joining the CIA, and you're not, <laughs> you're not going to be able to see him really ever unless you're praying to the Father in heaven. So, uh, I mean, yeah, what a sacrifice. And there's even that line, you know, woman, my hour has not come. Yeah. And, um, it, it's almost like, you know, once I do this, everything is going to change. Yes. Um, and we have to allow that to happen to us when we're praying. Um, you know, you should never pray for something where you're not prepared for the answer. Mm. Uh, and in this regard, uh, once Jesus performs this miracle, there's no going back. Yeah. Once you pray for something, there's no going back. And you have to entrust all of that to, to God and, uh, and, and also accept yeah. the, the, the good consequences that come from it. So I think that the two themes that go together here are faith, and surrender to believe more deeply in Jesus Christ through the help of Mary and imitating Mary's surrender. Yeah. To believe in Jesus Christ is to let him write his story of love in our lives, uh, even if it's a little bit uh, not exactly according to our, our original <laughs> plot line. So we thank you for joining us today. We hope that uh, our mother, Mary, will grace each of us today with uh, a deeper faith and a deeper surrender to the love of God. 
Thank you for joining us, and we hope to speak with you tomorrow. God bless you. Good morning. This is Father Joseph Hagen. I'm joined once again by Brother Fersai Davis. We're speaking to you from the Priory of St. Vincent Fair, continuing our series on the Luminous Mysteries. Today, we will meditate together on the third Luminous Mystery, the Proclamation of the Kingdom, the Call to Repentance. Uh, this is a mystery beloved by Dominicans, but it's also such a... Most of the other mysteries are a single event. This is a sort of collection, a constellation of events. So, yeah. uh, well, Brother Fersai, what do you... How do you approach this mystery? Well, I must admit, uh, whenever, I, whenever I hear this mystery announced, uh, the proclamation of the kingdom, I used to teach uh, a catechism program called Totus Tuus, and in this program, for the little kids, the kindergartners, the first graders, we would sing a song about the rosary. And for this particular mystery, we had uh, kind of like a, a little action that goes with it. <laughs> so you kind of like uh, bring your hands to your face like you're about to play a bugle and uh -huh. you say the proclamation of the kingdom. And the kids just go crazy. And it was from that that you kind of explain that, you know, at a big parade, at a big, like, homecoming celebration, yes, 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 yes. Um, there's full fanfare. And yeah. God is calling us to the kingdom, and he's preaching what that kingdom is, and that we are both living in the kingdom right now, but we're called to the, 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 highest, uh, yes. the highest heaven to join him in, uh, you know, once we're, once we're kind of purified here on earth, yeah. purified in purgatory. Um, and so we have, that, we have that call to repentance, but it's that proclamation of the kingdom of heaven um, that all Christians are, are striving towards. And, yeah. and you can realize your place in, in this providential plan. Um, and so what's not to celebrate? I, for me, when I, pr when I pray this, rose, this mystery, very similar, I, you know, I pray that uh, by my life and by the life of the whole church, we would proclaim the kingdom and asking Mary to keep us true to that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just we're proclaiming, let's be nice to one another, or let's, you know, uh, it's not just an earthly thing we're doing. And not, there's earthly things involved, certainly. I'm not trying to disregard that. But, mm -hmm. but we're not, uh, there's something radically different. It was a supernatural kingdom. Yeah. And asking Mary to keep us true to that. And for me, I think about the Beatitudes because uh, the Beatitudes only make sense if Jesus Christ is Lord, yeah. if only if he truly died and is risen. Uh, and it's not just about everyone feeling rich and joyful. It's actually that we would find our blessedness in our poverty, in our, you know, in our mourning. This is how Christ you know, begins his proclamation of the kingdom uh, in Matthew's gospel. Uh, it's a powerful way. And asking Mary, keep me true to this proclamation, both in my own service of the gospel, but also in how I receive it. And that certainly entails that repentance of asking Mary, help me to let go of any baggage. Mm -hmm. it is, in some ways, the proclamation of the kingdom is like, get your plane tickets bought now. Yep. And it's like, okay, what am I put in my suitcase? And repentance is sort of, being honest about like, I don't need that for heaven. And in fact, if I try to take that through, you know, heaven, airport security is going to get red flagged. So let's just get that out of the suitcase now, you know? <laughs> well, I don't know what you're packing in your suitcase, but I hope you, yeah. The human heart has strange things yeah, in it. Yeah, there's not enough room for all your cacooses. So. No. <laughs> Good. Good. Well, we hope that today was a help in meditating on this mystery. It is, again, one of these sort of constellation mysteries. Um, thank you always for joining us. We hope to speak with you tomorrow. May God bless you. Good morning. This is Father Joseph Hagen. I'm joined once again by Brother Fersai Davis. We're here at the Priory of St. Vincent Fair to continue our series on the Luminous Mysteries. Today, we will meditate on the fourth luminous mystery, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. So, Brother Frasati, tell me, what do you meditate on with this mystery? Honestly, I think about bleach. Because <laughs> when the disciples are up on that mountain with Jesus, they see that his clothes turn dazzling white. Yes, yes, uh, yes. And it's just like, how did they get that way? 
Uh, is yeah. this a miracle? Is this just a vision? Is this just the disciples, mm -hmm. you know, seeing him in the in the most positive life light mm -hmm. because they now mm -hmm. realize more fully who he is? Uh, but there's something. Uh, there's something very mysterious about this fourth luminous mystery in that uh, we get a vision of uh, those prophets that have gone before the yes. disciples. You know, they've, they've studied the scriptures. They know the Old Testament. They know who Elijah is. They know who Noah is. And, uh, it, you know, seeing this in a vision, uh, it helps, helps kind of bring to the fore that uh, when we are going to meet our maker, we're going to see all these people who have gone before us and that our time on earth is so limited and yet uh, mm -hmm. and yet it's not it's just the beginning uh, mm -hmm. it's just a tiny sliver uh, in in relation to eternity and to kind of get that little glimpse of eternity yeah. when you see that glory of Jesus um, I mean it's just it's hard to actually envision what this would have been like for the apostles who saw yeah. us um, so it's, yeah, I think about bleach, but really that just leads to holier things. So. I, for me, it's that deep desire to see Jesus Christ. Uh, you, you mentioned both Moses and Elijah. Both of them in the Old Testament uh, do, don't see God's face, right? Moses asks and doesn't. Uh, he has to be hidden. Uh, Elijah, when he's in the in the mountain, when he goes out to see him, he hides his face. Uh, but here they see him, and the the apostles just see. Uh, when we talk about God being glorious, it's something so beautiful mm -hmm. and captivating. Uh, it thrills the heart, and you know, uh, it's easy for our life as Catholics to be routine. For our life as Catholics, just to be about following rules yeah. and just sort of like, uh, and we forget that we are being drawn by by a, by a beautiful God, which is weird to say, especially as men. But that's mm -hmm. kind of mystery of this is like yeah. the glory of Jesus Christ really captivates the heart, and and to seek His face. We talked about this with Father Hyacinth with the birth of Jesus how he reveals his face and here he's sort of revealing like the, the heavenly glory of his face mm -hmm. and that he draws us to him so that we would seek him more and more yeah yeah it's having that encounter with jesus face to face yeah. where you get a glimpse of the father um, yes yes and for the disciples to see that uh you know early on well before jesus's uh, crucifixion and yeah. resurrection yes um again they get a glimpse of what's to come uh, and how jealous we should be <laughs> of of what they were able to experience, what they were able to see, in order that they were able to preach Christ well after he's been crucified. Um, that they, like Mary, ponder those things in their in their hearts, uh, but are freely able to share those experiences and, and really to share that joy of the gospel. And the last thought to share is how the Father speaks again here, and he says, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. And how, I mean, I'm the kind of person I can keep talking to God. And this mystery reminds me, uh, you can talk as much as you want to God, but it might be good if you listen. That's, yeah. what, that's why I hear it said to myself often. Mm -hmm. uh, and just asking Mary for that grace to seek the face of Christ and to listen to him, knowing that it's his word that will bring the peace. And, and he's happy to listen to my words. And sometimes it's helpful to get the words out of me. Oh, yeah. um, but I need to listen to him. And so we thank you for listening to us. And we pray that you will have the grace to listen, not just to two friars, but to listen to the son today and to seek his face. And we ask Mary's help in all of this. Thank you once again. And we hope to speak with you tomorrow. God bless. Good morning, this is Father Joseph Hagen. I'm here once again with Brother Frasari Davis here at the Priory of St. Vincent Fair. We are continuing, in fact, concluding our series of meditations on the Luminous Mysteries. So today we are covering the fifth Luminous Mystery, the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. So Brother Frasari, this is, this is such a central thing for us as Catholics. Oh, yeah. How do you meditate on this mystery? Well, this is the source and summit of our faith. You yep. know, this yep. is... You know, this is the big pot of sauce that just gives us, <laughs> get, flavors the rest of our faith, flavors all the mysteries of faith. And, 
and really to believe in the Eucharist is to believe that Christ left himself to us, mm. not as a symbol, not as just some representation of his body. He, he actually left his body. He meant what he said. He meant what he said. And in doing that, we believe that every time we receive the Eucharist at Mass, we're actually receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity. So this isn't just some representation. Uh, and you can just imagine at the Last Supper what the disciples would have been thinking. Uh, yes, you know, yeah. why does this make us cannibals? Does like, this make us... Yeah, John chapter 6, too, with all, yeah. Yeah, and there, you know, there's a lot of suspicion on, yes. you know, we've been with you this whole time, Jesus, but now you're, you're asking us to do this. You're asking us to yeah. eat your flesh and drink your blood. Like, yeah. I don't know if I really want to do that. Um, and it really challenges us as Catholics. Do we believe what Jesus said? Mm. Um, and for us to have the faith to say, yes, I believe that this is truly your body and blood. Um, it is that faith that we bring to us with the reception of the Eucharist uh, that really helps flavor our faith. And in a particular way, I love how we turn to Mary for this. Mary, who gave Jesus Christ that physical body, that physical blood, right? She's a mother. It came from her bones. Yep. It came from her body. And she knows her son. And to ask her again, to, as you said, Brother Prasad, to increase our faith, to ask Mary to say, Mary, uh, I believe it already, but help me. Like, just tell me that's your son. Mm -hmm. In a particular way, I would, I would ask your prayers for all priests. Uh, something that's hit me at just as a, you know, a year and a month into the priesthood is when you're so close to it, uh, you can almost be be a little bit negligent and we pray that never happens but we know it can uh, where if priests begin to doubt or just let I me mean, not, not actively doubt just sort of not get too concerned about it, take it for granted um, well nothing goes well then you know and asking Mary to, to pray because at the Last Supper as Christ institutes the Eucharist he's also instituting the ordained priesthood mm -hmm. And to pray, they priests need Mary in a particular way, to to be true to their vocation, to be true to the Eucharist, uh, to allow Christ to wash their feet, to allow Christ to wash all of our feet, uh, but then also to be willing to live that Eucharistic life, where not only do we believe that Christ laid down His body for us in the Eucharist, but we in turn lay down our life for Him, that Eucharistic exchange. Yep where we say, Christ, this is my body, which is given up for you. That's true for all vocations. All vocations, they involve our body. They at least involve some headaches every now and then to offer up, offer up our body in this Eucharistic exchange with Christ who first offered himself to us. Right, and in every time we receive the Eucharist, you know, there's that moment where our bodies become tabernacles. Mm, and yes, yes, it's yes. not to use that, uh, that expression lightly, but just like we repose the Blessed Sacrament in the tab tabernacle in the church, mm. uh, every time a human being yes. receives this, this gift, this sacrifice, uh, Christ is dwelling within us. And uh, it's, it's another call to remember our baptismal yes, gift, our yes, promise that yes. just like we have the indwelling in the Trinity marked on our soul, at that moment of the reception of the Eucharist, we have the, the indwelling of the Trinity uh, within us in bodily form. And again, to ask Mary, what she, she who first carried Christ in her womb for nine months, but even more deeply, she carried him in her heart ever since the Annunciation, ask her mother help me to learn what it means to carry your son yep. in me today and each day and so thank you as always for joining us we pray that mary would help us to believe more deeply in the eucharist especially to intercede for all priests and that we would be able to carry carry christ in our bodies in our hearts with the same with a share of her love that devotion that full-hearted love for him uh, so again thank you for joining us we'll hopefully speak with you tomorrow and god bless you good morning this is father joseph hagen here at the priory of saint vincent fair i'm joined with our pastor father walter we also have a special guest father 
Jonah Teller, a recently ordained Dominican priest who just happened to be walking in the hallway at the wrong time, and we brought him in. And uh, as we're continuing our reflections on the rosary, well, we figured every Dominican should be ready to preach on the rosary, so we're going to test that hypothesis today. Today we begin the sorrowful mysteries, the sorrowful mysteries. And so today we, we start meditating on the agony in the garden. So, Father Jonah, Father Walter, uh, you can pick who goes first. What do you think about as you pray the first sorrowful mystery? Well, the, the, the agony in the garden always speaks to me of obedience. Mm. You know, it's that, that work by which you truly accept an assignment. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is receiving the ultimate assignment, of course. Yeah. But, but each of us in daily life and in big moments comes to a moment of accepting something, accepting a direction you'd rather not go in, yes. but yeah. finding God in it. So, Yeah, and I think that in comment on that, there's a, there's a lesson there about how we can embrace God's will and have it hurt and still have it be good. Mm. That yeah. we can know yeah. that we can embrace God's will and trust Him, but still there will be pain that won't go away for a time. So to know that obedience to God is not just about accepting His will and then immediately being flooded with comfortable feelings. It's about mm. trusting who your Father is and knowing that although the pain doesn't go away, you know your Father who loves you. and So you trust in Him and you accept mm -hmm. His will and His plan. And one way I think about this is like in movies, when you have a difficult thing coming up, there's usually like a great locker room pump up speech or like a montage of someone getting ready and like they're getting geared up to do it. Uh, and as Jesus is getting ready for the, the most difficult assignment in his life, it's not a pump up moment, but rather that simple surrender. Uh, and there's sometimes in my life where I want to get pumped up for something difficult. <laughs> I want to have a great locker room speech, you know, something to get me going. And uh, he simply affirms that his father, that God is his father, and he surrenders to him. So he knows the pain. He doesn't try to mask it and say, okay, I'm going to go in there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show them all who's the Savior, <laughs> right? He just says, Father, I'm your, yours and not my will, but your will be done, that, that surrender. That's right. And I think that's, that's it. And of course, Jesus knows that even in that moment of incredible loneliness, yes. which the garden is, you know, the disciples are sleeping. Yes. Yeah. You know, he knows that at some level he's not alone. Yeah, that he's with the Father. Yeah. One other just added PS thought here is in Luke's account, like there's blood coming from his forehead. He, I mean, he just has it like an analogy, like like blood. blood yeah. And the interesting thing for me is that the first blood he sheds in his passion is is by his own volition. It wasn't taken from him. And that comes to that idea, like in John 10, uh, the good shepherd, he lays down his life freely. He offers his blood freely. It wasn't ripped from him by the Roman soldiers. He already in the garden, out of love for the Father and love for us, is already offering his blood. Hmm. Any other add-ons? Hmm. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's enough, that's enough a, for today. That's, that's a fertile rosary right there. There you go. That's a good way to begin. So thank you again for joining us this morning. Uh, we hope that these are helpful in your prayer of the rosary. and uh, We hope to join with you tomorrow morning. Okay, have a good day and God bless. Good morning, this is Father Joseph Hagen. I'm here with our pastor, Father Walter, to continue our series on the Sorrowful Mysteries. Today we will meditate on the second Sorrowful Mystery, the Scourging at the Pillar. So Father Walter, I'll give you the uh, first go at this. What do you meditate on with the second Sorrowful Mystery? Well, the Scourging at the Pillar, I mean, is, um, I, has the form of a punishment, right? The scourging yes. is, is, the, is yep. what you do for a punishment. And so each of these mysteries, I think, is showing, each of these mysteries is showing you a facet of the larger mystery of the whole passion mm -hmm. in which Jesus is the suffering, and in this case, Jesus is the suffering servant mm -hmm. of whom we read in yeah. Isaiah, 50. the punishment yeah. due to us fell on him. And by his stripes we are healed. Yes, that's Isaiah right. 53. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's it. 
And that's, I, I think yeah. that's what I see, you know, is that there's a, the punishment, what is the punishment? Mm -hmm. You know, what is, what is the, 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 what is merited by all the lust, all the greed, all the deception that is in the world? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, the, that the result of all of that is that we're not capable of being near God. Mm. And Jesus stands in that place. And one thing that strikes me too about the punishment is that it's a very bloody, in a literal sense, punishment. Mm -hmm. And again, it's by his blood yeah. that we are saved. And so it's... I mean, you see this in different crucifixes. So sometimes when crucifixes are too... Uh, like uh, historically accurate, they're a little bit overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea that when Jesus Christ decided to save us by His blood, He went all in, and uh, just the amount of basically to convince us that uh, there's no limit to His mercy. He wants to pour out all of His blood, and or and to put it this way too, if He's willing to love us as He's being scourged. He's willing to love us today. Whatever, like, even when we make our mistakes, when we sin, right. uh, if He can love us, if He didn't flinch in loving us uh, as He was being tortured, uh, we can be confident that even when even when we have a really bad day or a bad week or a bad month, a bad year, uh, he, His love endures all things. That's right, it does. And I think, too, it helps us to recognize... Because I think it helps us to, to it helps us when we're mortified. You know, we, all of a sudden yeah. we're just shocked by something we've caused. Yes. And and damage we've done to somebody we can't undo, or you know, that that the weight of it he took. Yes. You know the weight of it, yeah. the weight of being human in that sense mm -hmm. of having regret that you can't of something you can't fix. Mm -hmm. That's no, that's good. It fits in there, I think. Now, I'm not authorized to give you homework, but basically, if you what we've been talking about is Isaiah chapter 53. So if you want to sort of meditate on that, that's a very powerful way to... It is the suffering servant songs, yeah, right? Yeah, that's a powerful way, especially with this mystery. Oh, yeah. Um, good. Well, that's thank you again, Father Walter. Of course, Father Joseph. Uh, I have a pleasure to be with you this morning. And we will continue this series. Uh, we hope today is a blessing to you and that the mercy and love of Jesus Christ is generous in your life, or to put it differently, we know it is, but we pray that we will have the faith to receive it and the faith to return it in love and mercy to him and to one another. And God bless you, and we'll talk with you tomorrow. Bye. Good morning. Once again, this is Father Joseph Hagen speaking with you from the Priory of St. Vincent Fair. I'm joined with Father Walter, and again, uh, our great privilege to have the, the guest new... The new Dominic, the newly ordained guest, sorry, it's still morning, I guess, Father Jonah here. Uh, today we are going to meditate on the third sorrowful mystery when Jesus is crowned with thorns. Father Jonah, I think you have something to lead us off with. Well, the mystery of the crowning of thorns in some way is one of the most human moments in Christ's passion because it's always struck me as so completely unnecessary. Mm. He's going to be executed, but the crowning of thorns and the mockery of the soldiers contributes in no way to actually killing Jesus. It's mm. sheerly to humiliate him. Just spite. And yeah. so it's, yeah. uh, you see that he, Christ enters into every aspect of human suffering, not just, he's not just there to do the job of get on the cross and die as soon as possible. He wants to let his love flow into every crevice of human mm -hmm. suffering, and so he permits himself to be mocked. And there's this one moment uh, within the crown of thorns where the soldiers begin to strike him, Yes. and yeah. they say, prophesy, who was it that struck you? And mm -hmm. uh, the really overwhelming thing to realize is that he knew. Yes. He knew the fist that was hitting his face, and not only did he know that soldier, that man, he, as God, was holding that man in existence. Mm -hmm. He was permitting that fist to hit him and did not retaliate. So you also see in this most unnecessary, mm -hmm. immature, evil moment, the humility and just 
flexible love of God that can receive even the sort of most uh, shameful things we do to him and to each other and to ourselves and still knows us, loves us, and mm-hmm. waits for us. And I love how, yeah, as you were saying, the knowledge and the love go together. So that he knows the whole story of each of these soldiers. Yeah. He knows when they've been hit. He knows the whole. And, and particularly thinking about how when they did hit him, most likely they would get some of his blood on them. Mm-hmm. And to see that mm-hmm. as him, as his gift. Like, I am here to save you even as you hate me. I will save you. We don't know in the particular life story of each of these soldiers how they ended up, but we do know that, you know, give it a couple centuries and the city of Rome is then belongs to Jesus Christ in a very powerful way. Uh, and just to see in a, in a very way that just boggles worldly logic that the meek are blessed because mm-hmm. they will inherit the land. Well, that's right. In, in, in a sense, Jesus is being mocked yes. by the crowning of the thorns, but actually, God is mocking earthly pretense. Mm. That's the aspect of the passion that every, every kind of imperial power that there is, religious, secular, the, crowd, the power of the mob is brought to bear on Jesus. Mm-hmm. And... and, and all of them are shown to be vain, you know, futile. Yes. You know, in the face of God's plan. And that sort of connects with like Psalm two, and there's another mm-hmm. Psalm, like mm-hmm. how like the the kings conspire against right. the Lord. Why this tumult among nations and they, right. among its peoples, this useless murmuring. Yeah. Useless and then it talks about they arise, the kings of the earth, princes plot against the Lord mm-hmm. and his, his anointed. anointed. And then the next line is he who sits in the levens. Heavens, heavens laughs. laughs. The yeah. Lord is laughing yeah. them to scorn, so that you know, God is not swayed. And this is fulfilled, though, in this strange way, where the mighty Lord, the King of Kings, uh, endures this suffering. That for for a bystander, they may think they may not see him as a Lord of Lords. They might see him as the Lord of Worms. You know, like that sort of insult he would receive, uh, and that. That calls us to that faith. Faith, first and foremost, in Christ himself, that in these moments of great meekness, he is still Lord. And then faith that when he calls us to similar moments of meekness, even just as simple as being misunderstood by someone, that we are with him in this mystery and that, uh, that we show our royal dignity as sons and daughters of the mm-hmm. Father by simply responding with some, oftentimes a quiet love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. Well, that's an intense mystery, but I mean, that's what it is. So uh, it's, it's an honor to meditate upon it with you and to meditate upon the face of Christ uh, with you. Let's ask St. Veronica, even though she comes later, but uh, her great love for the face of Christ. Uh, we ask the Lord to bless you today that you would know his face and that he would give you strength to respond simply with love to whatever happens today. Uh, Thank you as always for joining us and we hope to speak with you tomorrow. God bless. Good morning, this is Father Joseph Hagen. I'm here once again with our pastor, Father Walter. We're continuing our meditation on the Sorrowful Mysteries. Today we uh, arrive at the fourth Sorrowful Mystery, Jesus carrying his cross. So once again, Father, would you lead us off and tell us how you meditate upon this mystery? Yeah, sure. I, you, you know, for me, carrying the cross is the is carrying the burden of being human. Mm. You know that that yeah. hu- human beings, all of us, walk through life with a, with with a weight that cannot be escaped. Mm. And I think mostly it's it's the weight of finitude. Yes, you know, our limits, you're, yeah. you're, you're going to fail at things. You're going to misunderstand things. You're going to miscommunicate with people. You're going to get sick. Yeah, our bodies are limited. Very, right, you know, limited. you're going to yeah. you're going to get old. You're going to yeah. die, and and so the, the you know the carrying the cross is is carrying that burden, mm-hmm. you know. And so if you if the if you follow the injunction of Jesus, pick up your cross and follow me. Mm-hmm. It's it it's means that I'm willing to 
undergo without complaint the mystery of being human mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as a way to being as a way to reaching God. And one thing I would add to this is the the beautiful passage. I think it's at the end of chapter Matthew ten or Matthew eleven of um, "Come all to me, who all you who are burdened and labored." That's right. And then my yoke is sweet. And this is his yoke, carrying the cross. Right. And to see that Christ does not ask us to carry other things, the weight of being the person we want to be or the weight mm -hmm. of other people's expectations. Right. He simply asks us to carry the weight of, of being who he's called us to be, the mm -hmm. humanity of ourselves, the vocation we have to love. He doesn't ask. So one simple example is when I found myself uh, being judgmental, Judging people is actually very exhausting, at least for me. It is, yeah. And uh, and then I would say, I don't need to do this. <laughs> like that's a heavy burden yeah, to take to upon right. myself. Right. And Jesus Christ asked me to carry my cross, which means to love this person. But he doesn't ask me to have the burden of authority right. over them to right. to judge them. Right, and that's part of the weight of the cross too. The people you're with. Yeah. Oh yes. Right. No, I mean the yeah. people that are assigned to you. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what Father Walter's trying to tell me. <laughs> no. no, but that is. Because in, in, in a sense, too, if you're supposed to carry the cross with someone else, right. the Simon and I, Cyrene, sometimes they help you, but other times you're both carrying the cross and right. um, and you sort of go back and forth. Right, um, right. But the great hope, certainly, is the fact that Jesus Christ, uh, while he, in a certain sense he's physically done with the suffering, he is still there to carry our cross with us. That's it. Uh, and so the great, with the idea, the idea that the yoke is something for two oxen, and the cross is something both for Jesus and me and the whole communion of saints. Good. Yeah, yeah no, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and and um, the weight of it, the knowing that the weight that he has, he has again, his his carrying of the cross suggests that he wants us to be, and as you quoted that passage about his yoke, yeah. through his sacraments, through the gift of the passion, he wants us to, to be comfortable and peaceful carrying our humanity. Yes. Mm. You know? To do it with love and with gratitude and with right. peace. And to know that you're, we're accompanied in it. And particularly, too, remember the fourth station of the cross when Jesus meets his mother. Mm -hmm. And that when we pray this mystery, we pray it with Mary's help. Uh, to know that she is there, not just at the fourth station of our life, but every station. Uh, to comfort us, to console us, to strengthen us. To, to be that light of beauty. There's so much ugliness on the Via de la Rosa as he carries his cross. Right. But Mary brings that beauty. And so we pray for each other as we carry our cross today, that Jesus Christ would be our strength and that his beauty would come to us in a particular way through Mary's motherhood, that we would know her closeness. And because of that closeness, we would have, we would be courageous sons and daughters to just take the next step forward today in loving and forgiving. So God bless you. Thank you again for joining us and we hope to speak with you tomorrow. Bye. Good morning, this is Father Joseph Hagen. I'm here once again with Father Walter, our pastor. Today we conclude our meditation on the sorrowful mysteries with the fifth sorrowful mystery, the crucifixion and death of Jesus. This is certainly one of the just main moments in all of human history, uh, and we only have three to five minutes. So how do you want to Is that a warning? <laughs> How we can't do all seven last words. So, <laughs> how, how do you meditate upon? Well, what what comes to my mind at the moment is the solitude of the cross. Mm -hmm. That, in a sense, even though Jesus is surrounded by certain people, onlookers, you yeah. know, there are people there. Inevitably, suffering is solitary, and death is solitary. You know, yeah. Mary is at the foot of the cross. We call that the mystery of compassion, suffering yes. with. Yep, yep. But you, you, her, you can't take it away. You can't yep. make, you know. And so I think 
in the end, death for Jesus and for us is a it is a place we go alone. Mm -hmm. It is a moment we have alone. And that, like, whenever I'm able to speak with a good friend, if I'm going through a tough time, it's a great solace to speak with a friend. But they can't take it away. They can have that compassion, which is a great gift. It can spur mm -hmm. me on. But I still, right. by God's grace, have to. There's certain things that's only me and the Father. That's right. In a sense. Yeah. Yeah. And and um, and part of part of his suffering, part of his his crucifixion and death is my God, my God, why have you abandoned yes, me? Right? Yes. Okay, so no matter much no matter how much we have faith and no matter how much mm -hmm. Jesus has knowledge part of being human is not wanting to die. Yes. You know, and so... Just the psychological terror of it. That's right. And, and so in that moment, there's a sense of, be, like, a solitude, even a separation even from yes, God. Yes, yes. You know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, and the uh, one way on the sort of flip side of that is his great line, I thirst... So even as, he, because he psychologically experiences this distance from us because of our sins and such, he, he's not okay with it. He thirsts for us. He wants to bring us to himself. And that is just, for me, is a great solace again. I think we meditated on this a few days ago. But that if Jesus Christ even thirsts for me on Good Friday, then on my, other, on my bad days, he still says that. He still says I desire your friendship, um, even when even when I'm the one who just messed it up, <laughs> and that's a nice way of putting it. Even when I've like really sinned, he just still thirsts for my friendship. Yeah, and um, so even yeah, even if even with the loneliness of death, mm -hmm. the loneliness loneliness never becomes self pity. No, it's he's still. He's still going out of himself. He's mm -hmm. not. He right. doesn't contain himself. Yes. And which is what's sanctifying about it. Yes. You know. Um. One one sort of just Marian thought is I was talking to a parishioner who said, "How can I think about the crucifixion without getting?" It just seems she was saying it, it seems just so. We're so used to it. We see it everywhere. Like how can I like sort of reaccess this, reapproach it. And I said, well, think of, ask Mary to help you. Uh, because to see this mystery in particular through Mary's eyes, mm -hmm. uh, at least for me, I don't know if that will ever become callous to that. To think, what was it like to see your son suffer and to love him, but not be able to take his place, not be able to save him. Uh, and that that is a great way of keeping the reality of this mystery alive is to ask Mary, you know, what was it like? Or just, just ask her to help us uh, because that's her son. And well, since that's the essence yeah. of the rosary, isn't it? Yeah. You're asking through the Hail Marys yep. that, that the Blessed Mother aid your meditation and keep yeah. you focused. And she yeah. who has this like storehouse mm -hmm. of love and of knowledge of her son Right. Uh, is very generous in sharing that with us. I mean, just this is true with regular mothers. They love to talk about their children, uh, especially if your child is actually God. It, <laughs> there's all the more to talk about. Right. Good. Yeah, no, I think that's probably true. Um, you know, you just always, in the crucifixion, the other, the other piece of it is that Jesus endures what everyone is most afraid of. Mm, yep, yep. You know, and and mm -hmm. so he endures it not to spare us death because we're going to die. Yep. But to show us as well how facing that supreme moment in faith is also a narrow way through which we enter into glory. Mm -hmm. You know, so that you're you're, you're, you're entering in the narrow way as he does. I think this is brought up a lot in the middle chapters of Hebrews. I can't remember the exact, right. but like we follow him right. the way he's led us into the mm -hmm. heavenly sanctuary. He opened up a way in his own body right. for us. Mm -hmm. Mm 
which is a great comfort that we can't avoid these things, but he has gone before us. He will right. be our strength and he will be there for us. Right. Yes. In a, in a sense, it fulfills carrying the cross. Right? Yes. If you, you, you complete the full course of your humanity mm -hmm. so that our work as human beings is sort of not to, f not to, not to find the magic cure, the magic, mm -hmm. like the get rich scheme or the overnight diet that takes yeah. all. There's no golden ticket. Right, but, but to actually live in, in, to live in our humanity at every stage to be young, to be middle, to be old, yep. to experience sickness and to die. That all of that is part of what God uses to complete us. Mm. Good. Well, wherever we are today, we ask that Jesus Christ would be our strength, be our love, that we would know he desires our friendship, and that Mary, as our loving mother, would teach us more about her son, that we may love him, with the help of our Immaculate Heart. Thank you for joining us for these Sorrowful Mysteries. Thank you, Father Walter, for- Pleasure, indeed. I, I really enjoyed these. I, I wonder, I almost wish we could do homilies this way, just go on the different That's microphones right. and sure. just play badminton. Well, maybe we do, maybe one day you will. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> you heard it here first, I guess. Okay, well, enjoy your day, and we hope to speak with you soon. God bless. Good morning, this is Father Joseph Hagen, speaking with you from Priory of St. Vincent Fair. I'm joined once again by Father Hyacinth Grubb as we continue our meditations on the mysteries of the Rosary. Right now we're covering the glorious mysteries. We're beginning with the first glorious mystery today, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. This is, uh, Father Hyacinth, this is one of the central mysteries of our faith. There's so much here. Just give us a share of the different things that you think about when you meditate on this Rosary. I think the first thought is always Alleluia. Amen. Right? Yep, yep. Alleluia, the, the Lord is risen. Um, and it's wonderful that we, we pray this, rosary, uh, this mystery throughout the year. It's not just a, an Easter mystery, but throughout the year, the Lord is risen, which means that he has conquered death, mm, conquered his own yes. death, and, and conquered um, the ways in which uh, death introduces itself into our lives and in big ways and in small, all the, mm -hmm. the brokenness of the world has been healed in Christ. So yeah. it's a continual reminder of that, that we don't yet possess this in, in full, mm -hmm. right? We mm -hmm. won't until heaven, until the second coming. But right now we do possess that sort of pledge of future glory, the sort of down payment yeah. on that uh, healing of the world. And one of the healing images that's so prevalent in the resurrection is when Christ on the eighth day shows his wounds to Thomas. Even, I think, on the first day, he shows his wounds to the rest of the apostles. Mm -hmm. And the idea of asking the risen Christ to bring his sacred wounds, that it's by his wounds that we are healed, uh, and to see that, yeah, the risen Christ brings healing. You also can see that healing, when the risen Christ meets Peter, and he asks Peter three times, do you love me? And for each of us to acknowledge, on the one hand, certainly we are sinners, uh, but Christ simply asks us, do you love me? Uh, and behind that question is his pledge to us that he loves us. And to sort of see the risen Christ, he came to bring us that love, to bring us that mercy, no matter where we've been or even where we are when we pray the rosary, to, to allow Jesus Christ to offer us that healing. And you mentioned those, those wounds of Christ that we can meditate on so wonderfully in, in this Easter mystery. It's always important, I think, to remember that those wounds are glorified in his mm -hmm. resurrected body. Mm -hmm. They are no longer painful for him, and yet they're still present in some way. Mm -hmm. right? those, those wounds of Christ that he received out of love for us is something that he still bears in his body today for us. Um, and in our own lives, too, <clears throat> we can look forward to the healing that Christ brings us, knowing that that will heal our wounds, but heal them like, like his wounds were healed. You know, make them glorified and resurrected wounds. Yes, yes. And yet in some way we'll still carry them, or still carry the memory of them. Mm -hmm. um, because the, that, that memory of, of, of those wounds is the way in which, the way in which we have loved each other, and the mm -hmm. way in which God has loved us in and through all of the evils of this world. Good. So today, as we meditate on the resurrection, let us ask for that grace, that Jesus Christ who has conquered the grave, conquered death, would bring that victory to us.
bring us that healing, to bring us that love, that he would roll back any stones in our hearts and, and bring our whole heart into the light of his resurrected, glorious heart. Thank you for joining us. We hope to speak with you tomorrow. May God bless you. Good morning. This is Father Joseph Hagen coming to you once again from the Priory of St. Vincent Fair. It's my honor to be here with Father Hyacinth Grubb as we continue these meditations on the glorious mysteries. Today, we focus on the second glorious mystery, the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. Again, another powerful uh, feast, another powerful event. So Father Hyacinth, kick us off. What, what comes to your mind as you pray this mystery of the rosary? I, I think there's always a sort of twofold um, yes, sort right. of way to think about this mystery, at least, at least that I approach it. Um, it's what it means for the human race and what it means for heaven, mm -hmm. right? Because this, this mystery, what it is, is it is a celebration of Christ rising um, so that he is in his hum humanity, in his human body, in heaven, mm -hmm. right? And so this means that you and I, human beings, have someone who is of the same nature of, as us in heaven right now. And that, that's a wonderful thing. It means that um, heaven is, is not something separated from us or something apart from who we are in our humanity. It's something that uh, is already received our humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. And that, that's absolutely wonderful, too, from the, the side of heaven. That yes. heaven is now yeah. opened up in such a way yes, yes, that yes. Jesus is there in his body. It's not some sort of, um, you know, pie in the sky, clouds, mm -hmm. abstract, mm -hmm. not quite real mm -hmm. spiritual thing. It's, it's, you know, there's, there's a human body there, a living body, the resurrected body of the Lord. Yes. And, and for me, there's a twofold thing as well, just to, to go with that. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one side, Jesus Christ tells us before he ascends, Behold, I am with you always. And to know that he is with us, he is with you right now as you listen to this, wherever you are, Christ is with you. But on the other side, he wants us to be with him in heaven. And so that he's with us here, but as sort of a fellow pilgrim, if you will, on the way, leading us to heaven. And so the ascension, as just to say what you've been saying, Father Hyacinth, it sort of instills in us this idea of, we need to love here on earth, but earth is not our final home. And so for me, what this means is uh, I'll have my to-do list, I'll have my stuff I have to get done. But when I take up the rosary and meditate on the ascension, uh, it's not a, what I'm doing is not just taking a break from earthly work. I'm remembering uh, my first, my passport belongs to heaven, if that makes sense. Like I'm, a, I'm first a citizen of heaven. And to claim that identity by taking a break and meditating with our mother about her son's ascension. And to say, my brother, my Savior, Jesus Christ, has gone to heaven. That's where I belong. And I thank him that he's, all, he's still with me here, but he's with me here to bring me to himself in heaven. And I think this, this uh, mystery always says something, too, about how he's with us here. Yes. Right? Because we, we think of at the resurrection when... He saw Mary Magdalene, he said, don't touch me, Mary. Yes. Right? Because no longer is he present to us today as he was when he was in his earthly life. Mm -hmm. But now he is present in the Holy Spirit, which is what we'll meditate on next, and <laughs> yep. in the sacraments. Right? Christ is present to us here through the sacraments <clears throat> and through the Spirit um, so that he can bring us in our humanity to meet his sacred humanity face to face one day in heaven. Good. Well, thank you, Father Hassan. I love sharing these together. I hope that you also enjoy these meditations. They help you uh, to pray the rosary, to, to know the treasures of Mary's heart, and the treasure of her heart is simply Jesus Christ. May he be our all in all today. May he be with you wherever you are. And may he draw you to himself in heaven. God bless you, and we hope to speak with you tomorrow. Good morning. Once again, this is Father Joseph Hagen. It's coming to you from the Priory here at St. Vincent Fair and joined uh, once again by Father Hyacinth Grubb. We're continuing our series on the glorious mysteries of the Rosary. This is the third mystery, the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. With Father Hyacinth's uh, agreement, I'm going to kick us off because I love this mystery. Uh, so the Holy Spirit does a lot of things on Pentecost and after Pentecost. 
And when we think about Pentecost, we can think about all the apostolic graces. But the very first thing that happens is that the Holy Spirit, which is to say God, gives himself. He gives himself. That the gift of the Holy the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost is not just like a mission he gives to the apostles. It's not just a superpower he gives to the apostles. He gives the apostles nothing less than his very self. And so just as Jesus Christ was taken away in a certain sense, in a bodily sense, in the ascension, so now the Trinity comes to dwell in the hearts of his apostles through the Holy Spirit. And so we can talk about the apostolic and the movement outwards, but to recognize the very first thing that happens at Pentecost is that God gives himself to his disciples that he may reside in them and i think we it's always fruitful to go back to that name of the uh, of the holy spirit the yes. paraclete yes. which means the comforter or the advocate mm -hmm. right the holy spirit is the one who lives in our heart to comfort us along the way right as we walk mm -hmm. through this valley of tears mm -hmm. which is this world the holy spirit is there to give us comfort and confidence and hope and courage and he's also there as our advocate yes, yes. and <clears throat> scripturally this is uh Think of this in terms of a, a legal advocate, right? Mm -hmm. We go before Christ, uh, the, our, the judge, at the end of our life and at the end of time. Christ will judge the world. He will also save the world. You know, our judge is, is our savior, which yes, should give us yes, confidence. Yes. And it should also give us confidence that, that the Holy Spirit is our advocate, the one who speaks out for mm -hmm. us and in us and through us to, uh, to you know, be in our hearts, to justify us mm -hmm. before God, to make us holy to make us like God himself and that's that's the gift that's given to us and to make that bring that out even more to remember the the word accuser is given to the devil that's what Satan literally means is the accuser and that's again a legal term too it's the it's the person who wants to get you in jail essentially and to see that the accuser and the advocate are not on the same levels the accuser is a fallen angel, certainly greater than we are as humans. But the advocate we have is God himself. The, the other attorney is outmatched. And so even when, sort of, as St. Paul says, even when my heart accuses myself, I trust in the spirit. I trust in my advocate. And to have that deep, just that, to know that when God, even when God has to admonish us or God has to call us to grow, was well, always a call to growth and to love, even if it is a challenging call. It's never an accusation. It's never a cancellation of who we are, that God has given us his comforter, his, his, himself, to be our advocate. And it's only from, from meditating on that, which I think it should be the, the principal part of our meditation, yes. on, on the yeah. gift that God has given us. Only then do we are we able to go forth and, and to meditate on those other aspects of Pentecost, the ways in which... The Holy Spirit brings the apostles, brings us mm -hmm. out to others to bring mm -hmm. that to them the, the comfort and, and the advocacy that, mm -hmm. that God has given to us first. But first of all, it's, it's that gift of God that we ought to meditate yes. on and treasure in our hearts. And that is why uh, meditating upon the mystery of Pentecost by invoking and being in the arms of our mother is so powerful. She who was there at the first Pentecost teaching the disciples in the upper room to pray, guiding them in their prayer, assuring them that she who first was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, the Annunciation, was promising, teaching them about the promise, the Spirit that will overshadow them at the Pentecost. We pray to her, asking her help, that our hearts would be open to the very gift of the Holy Spirit, and that under her guidance, we would preach the gospel with boldness and with love. And so today, we ask for this grace of Pentecost to renew itself in our hearts. Again, nothing less than God himself dwelling in us and being open to wherever he sends us to proclaim him to all the nations. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Father Hyacinth, for being here. We hope to talk to you soon. God bless. Good morning. This is Father Joseph Hagen speaking to you once again from the Priory of St. Vincent Fair. I'm joined here with Father Hyacinth Grubb as we continue our meditations on the glorious mysteries. We now begin the fourth glorious mystery, and the fourth and the fifth mystery are some of the 
perhaps the more difficult ones because they're not in Scripture as events. You can see scriptural themes. So sometimes we can find them a little bit difficult. What am I supposed to think about with this? Um, so <laughs> if you don't mind being challenged, Father Hyacinth, <laughs> what do you think about uh, when you pray about the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary? Of course. Um, I think these two uh, mysteries are perhaps the most Marian, too. They're, they're yes. the most yeah. directly about Mary. They are. Um, and so the assumption, we, we, we meditate on that bringing up of Mary at the end of her earthly life <clears throat> into heaven itself, so that now, after the assumption and the ascension previously, yes. there are two human natures, two human bodies, two glorified and, and resurrected bodies in heaven. Uh, and this is especially a, a fulfillment of the promise given to each one of us. Mm. When we look at um, Christ's promise to us, he promises us heaven, if we'll accept it. Yeah. <clears throat> but he also promises more than that. He promises that on the last day, the last trumpet will sound and mm -hmm. he will raise all of the dead. Um, mm -hmm. All of mm -hmm. those who have gone before us, mm -hmm. us ourselves probably, unless he comes soon. Um, and to give us back our bodies so yes. that we will have glorified and risen bodies like he has now, which are healed of every wound and illness and disease and every mm -hmm. sort of uh, concupiscence, every temptation, every way in which we are fallen, healed of that. And this is uh, given to Mary already. Mm -hmm. Mary already possesses that so that we have not only a promise of this, but but it's already happened for one of us. Yes. And that's, I think that's 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to keep score at home. Mm -hmm. uh, with the assumption, too, similar to the ascension, I, I see that the double nature on one side, Mary now is with all of us because she is assumed. Uh, that she is our mother. That's, we have the picture of Our Lady Guadalupe here, the, uh, a replica, a copy of the original Tilma. And her beautiful words to uh, St. Juan Diego, Am I not here who am your mother? That idea that because she's assumed, she has not laid aside her motherhood. Mothers don't know how to lay aside her I don't mean in that in a harsh way, but mothers are always mothers in a beautiful way. And Mary is always our mother. But in the same way that Christ, the ascended Lord, is with us, but in a way that brings us to heaven, Mary too is with us as our mother, but so that we hurry, we speed our steps to heaven. To be in her presence. Uh, there's that beautiful promise too with uh, at least the brown scapular that whoever wears this, right, Mary will bring them to heaven. And this idea of uh, asking our, our Lady at the hour of our death with every Hail Mary that she who was assumed to heaven would bring us there quickly. Even if, it, even if we just go simply spirit right now, we have to wait, as you were saying, Father Hyacinth, for the resurrection of our bodies that we ask Our Lady to speed us to heaven. And in a, a beautiful way, just to sort yeah. of highlight what you've already said, um, this parallels the ascension, right? Yes. Christ is able to be present to each one of us individually, simultaneously, because yes. he's in heaven now, and so is Mary. Right? If she was on earth somewhere, she could only be present to one of us. She could only mm -hmm. embrace mm -hmm. one of us mm -hmm. at a time. But right now, because she is in heaven with her son, she is able to embrace each and every one of us in her love and then that's a great gift given to her yeah. but given through her to each of us and so today let us pray for this grace of the assumption in our lives that we may know mary's presence whether we're having a great day whether not so great even if we feel terribly sinful right we call the refuge of sinners she's not ashamed to be our mother and so may we have that awareness that she is with us and again may we Take her hand as we hold the rosary, that she may speed us to heaven to be with her son, to be with the Father, all in the Holy Spirit. Thank you always for joining us. Thank you, Father Hyacinth, for being here. And we hope to speak with you soon, speak with you tomorrow. God bless you. Good morning. This is Father Joseph Hagen here uh, with Father Hyacinth Grubb, speaking with you from the Priory of St. Vincent Fair. As we continue, in fact, we conclude our meditations on the glorious mysteries and we conclude our meditations on the rosary themselves. Uh, I've been really enjoying these. I hope you've been enjoying them as well. Hopefully they've been helping you uh, pray, hoping you in your relationship with Mary and with Jesus. So today we're going to meditate together on the fifth glorious mystery, the coronation of Mary as queen of heaven and earth. And well, the Father Hyacinth, we got to earn our keep because this is not 
this is probably one of the tougher ones. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I'll take that, make that assertion. Uh, what do we think about with this? I'll, I'll take a first crack, but please uh, be the cleanup hitter and, and take us home here. Um, for me, I think about if Mary, who is my mother, if she's also a queen, what does that mean about every Christian? Right? If our mother is queen, then we are, well, we sort of have a royal vocation, right? That we are given, right? we, we share in Christ's kingship from baptism, and Mary's queenship sort of makes that more evident, that we are to live with a sort of royal dignity because we are so loved by God in a way that both speaks about the self-control of someone with royal dignity, but also in the way we treat others, to treat others with that kindness, with uh, not hypocrisy by any means, but, but always seeking to create a place for them to realize that they also have this royal vocation uh, in Christ, as St. Peter says, we are a royal priesthood in his grace. And we don't talk about this sort of royal sense of things very often. I mean, we're, we're Americans here, right? Yeah. We're not, we're not well, so sure about kings. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got rid of one. It was a great musical about it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but here, at least, this, this assertion of, well, the kingship of Christ first, and then from yes. that, the queenship of Mary is is something that should be very comforting to us in every circumstance of our life, that, mm. that Christ is the king. Yes. And this should give us great peace because it means that whatever is going on in the world, whatever is going mm -hmm. on in our own relationships, whatever is going on in our own hearts, Christ is the king. Mm. And so we don't have to worry about what's going to happen in the mm -hmm. world, in our relationships, in our hearts. Christ is the king. And Mary, who is his mother, is the queen. Right? Mm -hmm. And so when we have um, this, this wonderful advocate mm -hmm. in Mary who, for us, and she is, she is the queen. We can look, I mean, all, this is all through scripture, but it's not only in scripture. It's yeah. just this uh, very powerful idea mm -hmm. that when one wants to go to a king for something in particular importance and delicacy, mm -hmm. you, ha you go to the queen first, right? yes. especially when she is your mother. She is, she is mother, close right? to your heart, um, and she is always ready to go to Christ with you to approach that king in confidence that he is sovereign, he is in charge and taking care of this, and he's doing that for the good of the world and for the good of our souls. And I love this, Father Hyacinth. So this both saves us from being too caught up by earthly politics, which is to say, keeps us from wasting needless anxiety. How easy it is to get, work, work, get ourselves worked up about whatever politician we don't like, right? We can spend the whole day thinking about that. This saves us from that. It also saves us from sort of thinking, uh, even if we never put the words on it, but we can sometimes think about God simply as a master and we're his slaves, that he's a rule giver, we're his followers, uh, that he's a judge and we are, you know, um, we're there to be sentenced by him. Okay, there might be something, there might be, elements of truth in those, but they can also be very, very misleading. And to see that, right, the way God treated Mary to elevate her to her queenship shows his blueprint for all of us, that he came not just to collect slaves, he came to collect sons and daughters. He came to, again, give us a share in this royal vocation that we would be, um, we would magnify Christ's kingship uh, here. I don't know if you could hear in the background, we just got a lightning strike, the power, right? Uh, and we are called, right, this, the power of heaven coming down to earth. Um, that's some part of this royal vocation to like show the power, but through that sort of royal meekness. And perhaps that's one way to do it, is to take the Beatitudes, put the royal, word royal, our, we, we are to be poor in spirit, but in a royal way. We would be to be meek, but in a royal way. It's not, we're not doormats. It's because we have this sort of dignity of someone who's royal, someone who has a queen for a mother, someone who is um, under the sovereignty of Christ the King. That's why we are meek. 
And that should give us a great uh, kind of template for our actions, the sort of spirit in which we are to live in the world as, you know, royal sons and daughters of God, bringing, who's, who's always bringing us closer and closer to his kingdom through the work of the spirit in our hearts and under the intercession and guidance of Mary, our mother. God. Well, thank you for joining us for all of these. We, again, hope that these have been helping your prayer. Uh, please pray for us. We'll know of our prayers for you. And we'll see what series we come up with next. Okay. God bless you. Have a good day.